I'd just like to thank you all for joining us, joining us today for our third um, online session. And we'd like to welcome Amanda from Mellinger Gwynt. Um, Amanda has always been interested in art and design, but her degree is in English and history. She then became a tax inspector. She joined Mellinger Gwynt in 1986 when there were just 12 employees, they now have 42. Within the business, you usually describe their roles as Avion, the creative director, and Amanda, the oily rag. So I'll pass everything on to you, Amanda, if you want to. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for turning up to listen to me. Um, I'm just gonna talk about the family history of, of Melintra Wint really, and, and how we got from A to B, I suppose. Is it okay now if I start to share my screen? Okay, so I'm gonna hope this is going to work. Is that all right? Yeah, grand. Okay, lovely. Okay. Um, so um, I could see from the list of participants, there's quite a few people who already know about us, but for the people who don't, um, Melin Tregwint um, is a very tiny rural woolen mill in Pembrokeshire. Um, excuse me, I'm just having a trouble here getting from one screen to another. Oh, there we are. Um, it was originally part of the Tregwint family estate um, and was in the care of some family really up until the 1890s. It's, although it's been in existence, we know the 17th century, it's only really had about four owners in that time. Um, it was originally sold um, out of the family in, in uh, 1890. And uh, the records at that time showed that it belonged to an Anne Evans, who in fact was uh, Lloyd George's auntie. And, um, she ran it with with a mill manager who eventually bought it from her after she after her death and um he ran it until uh, 2012 i think um that was the point at which we got involved um my husband's grandfather henry was apprenticed to his older brother who'd been and learned to weave in evile wen which is sort of on the borders of pembrokeshire and Carmarthenshire. um he married uh esther my husband's grandmother, and I think she'd just inherited from her father, so he was actually able to buy the mill outright. Uh, so he came to an auction in Fishguard, bid for the mill, and he was successful, and he bought it for £760 in May 1912. And in fact, we have a copy of the cheque stub for the deposit that he wrote for it in one of the drawers at home. Um, it's a problem of being a long time business. She went up with all sorts of information tucked away all over. Um, obviously, in those days, it was very much part of the community. Uh, fleece would be bought from the local farms, processed. Um, they would have done carding, spinning, dyeing in an old copper boiler, and tipping the waste water down into the stream, which apparently had more fish in it those days than it has now. Um, and then they would uh, process the yarn, they would either weave it, they would turn it into knitting wool, or they would sell it back as knitting yarn or cloth to the farms. Um, and I think one of the things we forget when you think about it is that 1912, there were you know, no cars, no phone, hardly any roads, and everything that people wore or used had to be made. And it, I, I was amazed to discover that in our little village, which doesn't even have a shop or a post office, there were 17 tailors at the turn of the century because everybody had to have their clothes made for them and if there wasn't any money around then they would barter uh, we've got the old ledgers going back to 19 uh, to 20 yes 1912 um, where with some farms they would henry would barter so he bartered a motorbike for um a bolt of cloth at some point he bartered blankets for a pig i mean I think it really was a very very localized rural economy um, and you can see from the, the um, picture on the left, you know, it was flying shuttle looms, um, water driven. Um, but it, it did change um, um, over time. Um, the actual mill building is still there, still ex extant. It's very, very tiny. And in fact, Henry Griffiths built the weaving shed on the back end in the 1920s, which we're still using. Um, so that, that was our... our new building 
uh, in the early 20th century. And the, the sort of milestones that we kind of picked out are um, that Avion's father, Howard, went to work with his father when he was 16, uh, 14, in fact, his mother died when he was very young and there were two brothers. Um, the older brother waived his right to the mill. He wanted to go to university. Um, he ended up becoming an academic, but Howard stayed with his father, learned to weave, um, and actually remained at the mill and uh, really right up until the end of his life when he was almost 90 when he died and he was still packing parcels up until the last minute. Um, he and his wife, Elena, had well, he married Elena. She was quite a lot younger than him. Um, she was only 18 when she married. And um, they they lived and worked at the, at the mill, both of them. Elena had loved being in the shop. This is a picture at the top of her in the shop back in the 1980s when we used to have bolts of tweed and flannel and these very strange little Welsh dolls that had slightly slanty eyes and I think must have been made in the Far East somewhere but were incredibly popular. Uh, but they were... They were the shop um, really was something that happened in the 1950s. I think Henry had been very much tied into the, you know, the local community and just sort of supplying, working with local farmers. They did a little bit of, uh, of mail order, amazingly. They, the, everything was packed and sent from the nearest railhead, which was the Fishguard Harbour railhead in those days. Um, but Howard, I think, could see the potential for tourism once visitors started arriving in Pembrokeshire. And he originally had it opened a shop in, in the in the house, in the sitting room. And then he, when Avion was a tiny little boy, there's a picture of him on his sit-on tractor with his dad when they were building the very first shop. And it is actually still part of the shop that we have today. So, um, yeah, the shop, I think, um, and the tourism was, was kind of like their, their, their spin on, um, on what they were doing. Um, in the, producing things like honeycomb, um, clothing tweed, clothing flannel, double cloth cartons, signature double cloths, obviously. Um, and they were, um, they were starting to become a, a wider base for customers, I think. A lot of the mills back in the 80s were all supplying one big customer in America who used to buy off all of them, um, which was a, a neat way of driving prices down and keeping competition high. Um, in those days, there were 12 people. Now we're at 42, that last head count. Um, when I joined in 1986, there were 12 of us. Um, and in those days, I think that there'd already been some quite fundamental changes to how the mill operated. Uh, things like um, carding, spinning, dyeing had gone. Um, the carding engines, I think, were were quite frightening. I've seen the ones at the museum and I'm sure Anne's got stories to tell about them as well. And, but I think Howard was quite a good businessman and I think he really focused on the idea of design and weave. He could see that by being close to the customer that would enable the mill to um, you know, make, make the best possible profit, I suppose. Um, it is interesting that back in the day, all of the mills were using probably the same spinners in Yorkshire who were sending a lorry down once a week or once a fortnight with yarn for all the factories and taking back cloth for all the for finishing to the finishing plants up in Yorkshire and Scotland. Um, and uh, today it's it's slightly different. I think we, we're far more sort of um, just in time on the manufacturing than perhaps we were back in the back in the eighties. Having said that, I think it's also turning full circle because now there's much more interest in British yarn, Welsh yarn. And there's a lot of work going on, you know, to try and reposition us so that not only are we producing in Wales, but we're producing with Welsh yarn where we can. Um, let's see what's next. Oh, yes. These photographs were taken just a couple of weeks ago when we transitioned to an employee ownership trust. So these photographs of the team gathered for a drink outside the cafe and then outside the mill for a, a photo shoot. And it's just quite nice to see such a lot of, of young faces in there. They are spread across um, different departments. We're open seven days a week, 362 days of the year. We're in a closed Christmas day, Boxing Day and New Year's Day. And within, within the business, we sort of break out into groups, which would, I suppose, be um, Design and Weave, which is the actual production side, um, the fulfillment side, where the finished cloth comes back from finishing and is cut, sewn and sent out to customers, and that could be trade customers, export customers, mail order customers, or online customers. 
and then the guys were based very much on site at the at the shop and cafe and the admin end of everything so those are the things that that we think make us special that we are very much part of where we're where we're based we're a, avian always says we're a somewhere business you know the, the the product is made here in our loop we've only got five looms if anything that's got a melintrogen label on it was made on one of those five looms in this particular site and there's a huge sort of heritage of tradition and history and knowledge and information and skills and i think part of the thinking behind the trust was the idea that we could preserve that and um, save it for the future so i've got i don't know if it'll work i'm hoping that it will there's a little little video just of the things that we do do on the production side from design to actually creating a finished cloth and i'm hoping that if it all goes according to plan this will play fingers crossed This is uh, Sophie hand looming, uh, which we often do to trial colours. We're never quite, you know, we've got 3D CAD, but we, we do like to see the yarn in real life before we commit to a production run on something new. This is our water wheel. We've got one of the few internal water wheels in the UK, although it's not powering anything at the moment, but we will get there eventually. Tying on a new walk. I think this is one of our classic cartons that we've been making since the 1960s, in fact. There we are. That looks like as if that's finished. So I shall move on. Um, the shop was obviously, as I said, has been there since the 1950s. That little the picture on the bottom left is the front door of the shop and that was just originally one room and it's kind of grown a bit like topsy like everything else on site uh, but we built our new toilets um back in 2017 and i think don't think either of us really thought what an impact that would actually have on on the place um it's made the site much more sticky for tourists and for locals so all through the year, we get local people coming to meet friends for coffee or for lunch, going for a walk, walking the dog on the beach, coming for Sunday lunch. And then we put on special events like um, supper clubs, jazz brunches, Christmas fairs. And that's really great because, you know, we were at one point in a tourism bubble. And now I think we're partly there, obviously, but we're also still part of our community. And I, I think we're really pleased about that. I love the fact that I will see people I know when I pop into the cafe for a cup of coffee. And we obviously make different products. I mean, we're very much, I think we've been really lucky that we've been kind of seen as, as kind of iconic. That we still make the classic double cloths and the designs on the left, you can see the, um, uh, the vintage star that's, really been in production here since the 1950s and then in the top left hand corner there's a little little design of a welsh lady in the bottom left is a, a love spoon both of which were created by our in-house designer um, in the same tradition then obviously we make other products because you, although i keep saying to people you can never have too many blankets i think there's a point at which perhaps you can so we make clothing bags and accessories and we do try very hard uh, where we can to make those to make those with the uh, small producers who um, have the same kind of skills that we do our small companies or specialists and I think one of the things that Adrian and I found really interesting in, in our time here has been <coughs> being asked to do collaborations with people all sorts of things um, some have been art products some have been um, for specific hotels or department stores and some have just been supplying fabrics to see what students can do with it um, but I, Adain Avinon was really interesting that was, was taking one of our designs uh, which again has been in production since certainly the early 90s the Madison and um, we were asked to produce some fabric to wrap an aeroplane as part of the cultural olympiad in 2012 and then Sophie created a miniature version of the same fabric. 
which was supposed to be the air hostess costumes. Um, that was really great fun. We got, I think the nicest thing about that <coughs> was actually the plane was wrapped outside the museum in Swansea and people were asked to gather with their, uh, with their cartons, with their bedspreads, with their Welsh clothing from the 50s and 60s for a tea and Tupperware party. And it was just lovely seeing what people were able to bring out of their store cupboards or, or attics and share. We found some fantastic things. We also did a project for Waitrose <coughs> where they asked if we'd make them a, a picnic rug. And we explained that we didn't make them in wands. And they said, no, they wanted a really big one. And in fact, this was quite an undertaking. Um, fortunately, the guys in the mill were all up for doing it. Fortunately, the yarn supplier was able to find enough yarn in four colours that we could actually weave on two separate looms, something like 40 pieces of fabric, which all had to go off to be sewn together to make the world's biggest picnic rug. And I think there might even be a video of that. So I'm hoping that... So that was quite interesting. It was all shot in South Africa because they needed to film it in April and they weren't sure the weather would be nice in the UK. Um, but that was, that was a really nice thing to be associated with. And I love the fact that all the blankets have gone to orphanages and aid, AIDS orphanages. So they've, even though they, they, you know, it seemed like a huge undertaking, it's gone to a, so they've all gone to good homes in the end. And then we, we did another project based on the, um, the Welsh, um, uh, going to Patagonia. Uh, there was a, a theatre production for National Theatre Wales and the, this design was actually based on um, an old photograph of the preacher, Michael D. Jones, who persuaded everybody that they should go to Wales, uh, leave Wales and uh, go to uh, Patagonia for a better life. He was actually wearing a sort of asked, uh, an Indian shawl and, and that was very much based on it, but with kind of wild colour. Um, so that was a lovely project. Um, and then uh, recently we, we've done a project for, for a, a Welsh-owned hotel in Switzerland where they commissioned a, a double cloth design, again, sort of traditional Carthen idea, but this was based on the idea of combining a, a Welsh double cloth with a, with a Swiss cross. And uh, yeah, that, was, that was really successful. We've also been picked out by um, Muji in Japan. They, they, they used to be very much known as a no brand company, but they do have a thing called Muji Found where they are looking for things that they think are um, best examples of particular things that come from particular places in the world. This idea about being a somewhere company. And in fact, they, they chose us uh, for the Welsh double cloth. They, we also had um, Welsh tartan, certain kinds of Indian tinware. So it's really interesting to be seen as a sort of iconic and that what we do in Wales, that our history and our tradition has value for people in other cultures and that they actually appreciate that. I think that's been one of the things that we've, we've learned over time, that the authenticity and the story is really, really important and increasingly so in this very connected world we live in. 
This is some examples of work done with students. Again, this is the vintage star design. This was really rather lovely um, fashion collaboration. And uh, yes, another one which is slightly, slightly less. I can't imagine myself wearing that in fish guard, but I think it's fabulous, and I love the colour. Um, and yeah, that's kind of really that's kind of us in a nutshell. Really, that's sort of what we're about, what we what we think is important, and what we want to do for the company. We like to think, you know, that we've been a Cam family company for 110 years, and we like to think that. You know, it's going to have a business plan that will keep it going for another 110 years and wonder where it will be at that point. Um, and I think if that's OK with you, I'll stop sharing the screen now and we can go back to you, Seaned. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, that was very interesting. Uh, we'll open up for a, some question and answer time. Um, I don't know if you want to put some on the chat or put your hand Man, up you, and we can... I might need you to do that. I'm not very techy, as you've already discovered today. <laughs> if you just want to put your hands up and then we'll come to you as, as a man. Um, Williams, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to know where... Where are the is all the are all the fleeces clean? Do you do that process as well, or do they come to you already cleaned? Yeah, we we used to do back in the day when Henry bought the mill. They would have pro they would have taken all the yarn in after shearing and just spent you know the rest of the year processing it. Um, but I think once we we moved away from carding, spinning, and dyeing, um, so either back in the back in the seventies and eighties we would order yarn from spinners in Yorkshire and they would deliver it, you know, dyed in on Hank or, or cone wound to us. And we would buy, uh, we used to forward order, I think either twice or three times a year, huge quantities. And then we'd call it off in lots week by week. And then we started working with other suppliers who held stock ranges. Um, and in a way that gave us quite a lot of freedom because you could call in, you know, small amounts as and when you wanted them. So I can do remember at one point when we were having yarn dyed for us, we did some work for Designers Guild and we dyed an orange for a sort of fluorescent orange. And I think it took about eight years to clear the stock out because we actually only needed a little bit in one of the designs. <laughs> but um, yeah, the idea that you could buy small quantities in, you know, kind of really made us more fleet of foot, more willing to sort of try shorter runs or different different things and see whether they worked you didn't have to make that huge commitment to a, a big bulk of yarn having said that i think we're moving away from that again now we're going back to looking to having more yarn made specifically for us i think the only for me the only thing that you lose out on that is a sort of aesthetic thing that we've um excuse me i've got a cold we've um we don't really use enough quantity to get mild yarn you know, so it's dyed in the fleece and then blenders so you get that lovely mixture of colors it tends to be if you're having it made for you it tends to be solid dyed and and like for me that's the only that's the only downside thank you sarah do you want to come in Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself there. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. It's really interesting and applaud you as a company really for your approach to the future um, with, with the trust of the employees. Um, just, just a quick question in terms of the water wheel, wheel you mentioned um, and your your aspirations for the future to become an even more um, sustainable yeah. business. Um, what, what are your plans in terms of uh, uh, renewable energy and, and so forth as well then? Well, we when we built the cafe, we... we whacked a whole load of solar panels onto the roof. So some of our production is runoff sunshine, which I feel quite pleased about. Um, we've got to replace the roof of the shop this year. And we'll, again, we'll put a solar installation up there. I would love to have the wheel generating. I mean, it, it can turn, it can, but the problem is the moment that you start um, wanting to turn that energy into power, even if it's just as simple as running off a V-belt into a battery, you've got to go through all the hoops about opening up um, abstraction licenses and things. So I'm actually in the early days of, of talking to NRA about that now. I'd love to do it because I'd love to. I, I've always had this dream that, that we could say that, you know, we make our cloth on sunshine and we run our lights off water. I just think that would be so cool. And, you know, we've got the technology to do both here. Thank you. 
Thank you. Nick, do you want to come in? Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, so just to come back to something you were saying earlier, would you consider um, starting to spin um, yarn again, or would that would that be too much of a technical, new technical thing that you wouldn't want to take on? I think it's, our problem is space. We're probably, hmm. We are so tiny. I mean, we are shoehorning our five looms and our walking wheel into one space. And really and truly, when I look at where the, the spinning mule used to be, it used to take up 50% of the mill and then 30% went into the carding engine. So you actually probably only had about three, two or three looms if you were lucky. Right. Um, so it's, it's a difficult one. What I do find encouraging is how many people are doing more in the way of of yarn processing in the uk now i mean you know there are companies who have you know, reshored or or companies that have um you know expanded and particularly some of the old it's really nice to see people who are doing mule spinning um still being able to offer that in the uk and expanding what they're doing right, you, you might have said this already but do you only work with local yarn or or do you work with variety of yarns well i think you know when we're buying yarn for merchants a lot of it comes from all over the world i mean particularly things like lamb's wools, which obviously have a lot of merino in them they're southern hemisphere but we are we've worked with um, susie on the cambrian mountains wool uh, we've developed a weaving worsted which we're just getting a new delivery in now um we've done some denim in that which is quite interesting um, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really pleased that we're being able to use Welsh wool, and it, it's looking as though that more and more attributable yarn is going to be available, and that will be fantastic, because if it's there, we will use it. It's, it's just, I'm sure Susie will tell you, you know, yeah, how long of, it is. <laughs> yeah, of, of, of it being hard to get hold of as well as, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 and also it's, it's. Because, because it's kind of because it's never get that sort of critical mass of what we've got, you know, there's tons of it coming through all the time. So you can always buy into it. You're always having to make that commitment and then use it. And then halfway through, you're making another commitment. But it's 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 not quite seamless yet, but it's getting there. It's certainly I'm really excited to see what what we're going to be doing with the next batches of yarn that come in from the oh, Camry Mountains yeah. initiative. And just, sorry, just one more question. Um, what's the sort of percentage of own design versus people coming in and saying, I want you to do this for me? Uh, I would say it's probably 90% our own. 90% our own, all oh, right. Okay. We're, we're, you know, we're not big. And I think you can, we're in the lucky position that we can pick and choose who to work with. Mm -hmm. um, if people come to us with projects and they fit in and we've got capacity, then we're always going to think about it. But so many of them, you know, you, you want to work with people where it kind of benefits them and benefits you. So it's co-branded and, yeah. and it builds our brand and it supports theirs. And it's the whole thing has a more status, if you like, than just saying, oh, well, we don't mind who we wait for and we don't want any credit for it. Because I think what we do is too rare and too precious to take that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Uh, William, do you want to come in? Yes, hi there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the employee-owned trust and whether that was an easy exercise to undertake or a long drawn out? What were the um, trials and tribulations? Or maybe there weren't any. I, I think... I think it was the best solution for us. I mean, I certainly, you know, sort of four or five years ago, people were starting to sort of contact us and, you know, offering to find us matches to sell the business and all that kind of thing. And, and we know enough people who've had creative companies and have thought they'd found partners who shared the values. And funny enough, suddenly at the end of it, it they didn't. Um, and I think when we, when we heard about the trust, we, we thought it was really interesting. We, had a huge amount of help from Development Bank of Wales and from the Wales Co-op in sort of just sort of, you know, holding our hands, you know, and explaining the process. And I think once we decided that was the right thing for us, um, it was it, it was more straightforward than I thought it would be. There were, you know, obviously issues and pitfalls, it's like anything, but we, we had terrific solicitors acting for the trust and they held our hands and they held the staff hands as well, because it's a big ask, you know, 
it, not that people had to pay to, to become part of this because our shares were put in trust for the staff and then they all effectively if they work for the business they have a stake uh, but they don't actually have to put any money up for it so yeah I mean it, it, it also it's quite a lot of it's a steep learning curve for everybody but I think yeah I think Wales Co-op came and they talked to us and they talked to the team they came back and talked to everybody again. The solicitors came and talked to everybody. So I think, you know, the talking process all the way through of trying to reassure people that it wasn't going to be really, we weren't jumping off the edge of a cliff like lemmings, you know, it was actually thought through and planned and there was a structure to it. Um, so it's early days yet. I mean, we're not quite a month old yet as, a, as an employee owned company, but um, yeah, I think the signs are positive. So had you made the decision to go down that route before you involve staff or did you only make the decision once you'd involve staff in the process well i think so i think of a cart and horse question really, I think. yeah i think i think we thought it was the right thing and we certainly mentioned it to our management team early on but i think we told all the staff once we put up, you know, once we decided that was the best and the safest route to keep everybody in employment here, to keep the jobs here, to keep the skills here, and to give the company control over its own destiny so that it wasn't going to be asset stripped or sold to people whose values might be rather different or might see it as a, you know, in a different way to the way that the guy, our, our team see it. Mm. Can, sorry to I don't want to monopolize the question but if I just, just one more supplementary well she said all the team came on board were there any that didn't think it was a good idea and have not participated I I think because it's it's how can I explain it's it's kind of no change and yet there is a change if, you know, you've got the same management team doing the same jobs that they've always done, but you have people who are going to become di or are directors or may become directors. And that then, you know, for them, that is a steep learning curve. But for most people coming to work every day and doing their job, things haven't changed very much. But there are, there's probably going to be more transparency. Certainly we'll be having more regular meetings. I think financial in, information is going to be shared with, with everybody because we have employee trustees as well as directors. And in that sense, we're hoping that everybody will understand what the company altogether has to do to get to the end of every year in order to give a distribution and in order to do capital works and all those other things that we want to do. So I think the hoping is that it, it's it's going to be more open and, and I think... Um, the strain will be taken by the people who take the, the higher levels in the company, but the, the day to day won't change, except that I hope people will feel more secure. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, William. Uh, Sarah, do you want to come back? Hello. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't want to take over too many of the questions either, but just linking back to the question, I think, um, that, and, and uh, a comment that was made earlier by the question that Nick asked, uh, I think it was Nick, um, just in terms of sourcing more Welsh wool um, and, and everyone in, as, who's uh, part of the uh, Mentor Mons cluster would have would have uh, been aware of the of an event um, that's been held on the 11th of May. Um, the, the basis of the meeting really is to bring as many people together as possible to discuss the potential of, um, of developing a commercial wool processing facility in Wales um, to add value to Welsh wool for the benefits of the Welsh sheep farmers. So it's just um, just to raise awareness of that event, really, and um, and whether that would be of an interest to you um, as a company. I think anything that makes the supply chain easier to, to, to access has got to be good news, quite frankly. Um, you know, at the moment, it's very much you have to you have to find a find a find a supplier, find a quality, source it, go through all the hoops with British Wool about labelling and everything. So there's quite a lot, there's quite a lot to do just to just to put even, you know, non-Welsh but British wool into your into your stock ranges. But I think, yeah, anything that can help help with um, you know, getting getting it to market has got to be good. Right. Well, there's an open invitation for anyone um, to that event in Aberystwyth on the 11th of May to discuss the possibilities of, uh, of moving things forward. Thank you. 
Uh, Williams just put um, a question on the chat. Can you provide the name of the solicitor that you used? Yes, yes, happily. We used Geldards in Cardiff. We were given a list of quite a few from Wales Co-op and we interviewed all of them about what they could offer the, the trust and we were we're very impressed with their enthusiasm for the EOT as a as a, a sustainable route for keeping keeping Welsh companies indigenous to Wales, and I think that's one of the main reasons why we went with them. And they were they were incredibly professional, very brilliant, I thought, and handled us and all the paperwork really well. And it 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 you know if there were a few little niggles here and there, but by and large, it was fairly painless. Thank you. Any more questions? No. I would just like to thank you all for joining us today and um, thank you, Amanda, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. It was lovely to <laughs> thank you to everybody for turning up. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, good afternoon.